All right, now let's continue on with our presentation. So the etiology of congenital heart disease. So we want to find out what the causes of congenital heart disease are to understand the condition further. So we have environmental factors. Some of these include rubella, pulmonary artery stenosis, and patent ductus arteriosus are associated with rubella. Remember the P's, patent ducti ductus arteriosus and pulmonary artery stenosis. Maternal diabetes, you get conotruncal abnormalities. What does conotruncal abnormalities mean? In embryologic development, the aorta and pulmonary artery and also the part of the ventricle that leads towards these two vessels are called the conus arteriosus and truncus arteriosus. The conus arteriosus is the part of the right and left ventricle that's smooth that leads towards the outflow tracts and the truncus arteriosus is the actual outflow tracts. We'll go over these in more detail later, but these are some effects you can get from a problem with the conus and the truncus. So you get transposition of the great arteries, truncus arteriosus, or tetralogy of Fallot. And we're going to discuss these more in slides regarding each of these individual conditions. Drugs can also cause them. Some specific indications and associations you should know. Lithium with Epstein's anomaly, which we'll talk about later. That's known as atrialization of the right ventricle. We have isotretinoin, similar conotruncal abnormalities. Valproic acid can cause septal defects, important to know. And now we have some genetic factors. These also can play a huge role in congenital heart disease and be inherited. So we have chromosomal abnormalities, such as Down syndrome, Edwards syndrome, and Patau syndrome. And specifically, Down syndrome has some major problems. It has a failure of neural crest migration. Neural crest is the neural cells that leave the uh, neuroectoderm and migrate to the rest of the body. And if you have a failure of neural crest, you can have a lot of actual heart defects. The septums that are formed between the atria and the ventricles and also the valves are very commonly formed by neural crest and also the division of the truncus arteriosus into the aorta and pulmonary artery is also done by neural crest, known as the aortico pulmonary septum. So a simple neural crest migration issue can cause a lot of heart defects. Next we have Turner syndrome and the classic um, association is coarctation of the aorta, which we'll talk about. We also have mutations and deletions. And some of these include the George syndrome. The George syndrome is a problem with the branchial arches and this is going to result in an interrupted aortic arch, with causing, which, is, which is another name for complete coarctation. So coarctation means that you have a narrowing. Complete coarctation means it's completely closed off. And that's a common association with DeGeorge syndrome. Truncus arteriosus and tetralogy of Fallot. So these are all associated with DeGeorge syndrome, a problem with the branchial pouches. Next you have Noonan syndrome, which is pretty similar to Turner's. And it's got pulmonary stenosis and ASD associated. And you should know about Noonan is that it's autosomal dominant, unlike Turner's, which is a chromosomal XO abnormality. And it also is associated with pectus, pectus excavatum, where you have an inward depression in your chest. You have learning difficulties. And also, the similarity between Noonan syndrome and Turner's syndrome is you have a web neck. But in Noonan syndrome, the people affected are usually young males. So this is just a syndrome you might run into. It's good to know. Next slide. Now let's talk about types of congenital heart disease. So we've got now talked about where they come from. Now the next step is to talk about what they are. So let's start with cyanotic. These are more severe, more classic, more high yield. So let's talk about all of these different cyanotic heart diseases. The definition of cyanotic heart disease is venous blood directly entering the systemic circulation without oxygenation. So a myth that I want to clear up is that deoxygenated blood means no oxygen in it. That's actually not true. Venous blood has some oxygen, it just doesn't have nearly as much as oxygenated arterial blood. So some hypooxygenated blood is going to enter the systemic circulation and that's going to turn the child blue. Some examples. Here are all the examples here. I'm not going to go through all of them in the list, but we're going to go through an individual slide on each and every one of these conditions to help you understand them more clearly. Now we have the acyanotic conditions as well. These are conditions where you do not have cyanosis. It's not, the baby is not turning blue unless you get this thing called Eisenmenger syndrome over time, which we will talk about a little bit later. And cyanotic is usually associated with shunting of blood from the venous side to the arterial side without oxygenation by the lung. Acyanotic commonly is associated with shunting of blood from the oxygenated side to the deoxygenated side. So in that case, there's no blood going from the venous system directly into the arterial system. It's the other way around, so you don't get cyanosis. So the first type is obstructive. These are some examples of obstructive diseases that can lead to uh, heart disease that's not cyanotic. 
We have valvular abnormalities like stenosis, aortic, pulmonic. We have hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and vascular rings where anomalous aortic vessels can wrap around structures and cause problems. So we'll talk about these in our future slides. These are just good to go over now just as a overview. We also have left to right shunts that we mentioned. Left to right shunts mean that blood go from the left side of the heart or the oxygenated side of the heart to the deoxygenated side of the heart. So in the end, no deoxygenated blood is entering systemic circulation, so you're not cyanotic. ASD, VSD, PDA, AV canal. We'll talk about all of these different um, subtypes later on. And we also have congestive heart failure. This can be associated with either cyanotic or acyanotic, and we have some definitions that we can go over. What is the definition of congestive heart failure? When the cardiac output cannot meet the metabolic demands of the body. So this is called diastolic failure, a high output failure. So the cardiac output cannot meet the demands of the body. Or we can have it when the heart receives excessive venous return and is overwhelmed. That's called systolic failure. So let's talk about this in a little more detail. Diastolic failure means that the heart cannot relax, or it, high output failure means it cannot pump enough to meet the body's demands. So this can happen when the heart's too hypertrophied. It's so strong and muscular, it can't relax and can't fill with blood and cannot meet the demands of the body. And number two, you have systolic failure, meaning that the heart is so dilated and full of venous return that it can't contract it because you've excessively stretched the heart muscle and messed up the Frank Starling mechanism. We also have innocent murmurs that we'll talk about as well that are not problematic, and we will know how to identify those and differentiate them from the problematic murmurs.